The literature has described the need for inclusion of bilateral, superficial, temporal, and facial arteries, which ultimately demands the need for inclusion of the parotid glands during facial procurement. The authors of this manuscript state that this may lead to poor aesthetic results, limit facial nerve coaptation to the level of the main trunk, and add considerable operative time. This meaningful manuscript describes a novel and expeditious approach for full facial procurement solely perfused by the facial arteries, without the inclusion of the parotid glands, thus permitting distal facial nerve coaptation in proximity to the effector muscles. They initially performed three mock cadaver dissections prior to successfully completing three full face clinical transplants with an average dissection time of four hours. Although cadaveric vascular studies are prudent, they have certain limitations since they are adynamic and do not define the true angiosomal territory. With the exception of one parotid gland, which was preserved to provide facial bulk in the, the clinical cases, the parotid glands were not included in the remaining dissections. Although they performed cadaveric dissections that included the maxilla, it does not appear that the maxilla was included in all clinical cases, and therefore, could this have potentially altered the defined four-hour dissection times. The manuscript describes the dissection from the preauricular incision on top of the parotid fascia in the subsmass layer. It would be interesting to know how they were able to preserve the parotid gland in patient one, vascularized, and how they managed the stents and stuck. I agree that the inclusion of the submandibular gland is not necessary in cases that do not need floor of mouth mucosal reconstruction since it only creates added bulk and may result in sialoceles. The authors make a recommendation of limiting the cold ischemia time to four hours based on potential time limitations of the muscle. Although a reduced ischemia time is advantageous, these limitations are yet to be defined in the VCA literature and require further scientific investigation. They pay importance to the preservation of integration of functional units should the allograft ever fail. I'm not certain one is able to restore normal facial dimensions through the conservation of additional unnecessary facial bulk. The manuscript describes performing the vascular anastomoses with the face turned down on the recipient's chest and then proceeding with skeletal and soft tissue stabilization. Although this approach has proven successful, one could argue that initial skeletal fixation be performed in cases that require greater amounts of bony replacement and therefore potentially avoid excessive pedicle length, kinking, or stress on the vascular anastomoses. This is an early report of three cadaveric and three clinical cases using the approach described. They conclude that this is only a framework of their approach and the protocol continues to evolve based on gained clinical experience. I most certainly agree that this approach of full facial procurement is a simple and reproducible technique, clinically possible based on isolated bilateral facial artery perfusion and targeted sensory motor nerve coaptation. One could conceptualize that distal, distal facial nerve coaptation in proximity to the target organs expedites recovery, yet further comparative data will confirm this finding. The authors are to be congratulated for their incredible accomplishment and for their honest depiction of their groundbreaking experience.